Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering at the University of Calgary. And this is module seven in my computer networks lecture series, where I talk about the cyclical redundancy check error detection scheme. So we've already worked through the parity bit example and the internet checksum example. And those are both error detection schemes that are fundamentally based on the addition operator. But the thing that's a little bit different about the cyclical redundancy check or CRC is that it is based on division rather than addition. And as it turns out, working with division is going to allow us to do a lot better. So CRCs are much more powerful than the parity check or the internet checksum and are really the industry standard. So if you look in basically every standard that I'm familiar with, you will see CRCs used as the, the mechanism for uh, error detection. So we're going to actually spend a, a fair bit of time on CRCs, just so you really sort of understand them at a, at a fairly fundamental level. And Error detection, CRC error detection is a form of polynomial code that is based on a field of mathematics called binary field arithmetic. And it turns out that this sort of area is used for all kinds of communi digital communications codes. Error correction codes can actually, some families of error correction codes can be understood based on binary, binary field or finite field arithmetic. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction uh, into this area of math. And, you know, uh, when I've taught this in the past, the, the feedback I sometimes get from students is, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you the, you know, some of the fundamentals of binary field arithmetic, and we're going to work through all of this notation. And at the end of all of this, I'm going to show you a ones and zeros style notation that will lead us into understanding that CRCs are, are very efficiently implemented using uh, shift registers. And, you know, once we get to that sort of binary notation and, you know, you'll, you'll see that it, it's fairly compact. It's maybe a little bit more easier to understand than the polynomial notation that we're going to start out with. And sometimes, students will tell me, oh, this, you know, it's so much easier just with ones and zeros. How come you didn't just show us this from the start? And the reason is I, you know, particularly at a senior undergraduate level, I want you to understand a little bit of why we're doing what we're doing. So, you know, for many of you, you will be graduating and going to work in industry directly after or, or soon after taking this class. And, you know, I don't think I'm doing you any favors by sort of dumbing things down at this stage or just saying, oh, you know, it's too complicated. Let me just show you kind of the Wikipedia style. You know, this is just what it is, not why it is kind of explanation. So I do, you know, at several points in this course, dig into the underlying math because I, I really feel that this is what makes for a durable education. So not so much just understanding the what, but also understanding the why, because the what is going to change. So the standards that I'm using for examples now will change over the course of your working lifetime for sure. But the why the standards exist and the fundamental problems that the standards are trying to solve will endure compared to, you know, the particular solutions of the day. And so that's why I, I, I do dive into the details, particularly at this point. Okay, so let's get into some of the details. So first of all, I'm going to give you just a sort of a general background in binary field arithmetic, how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide polynomials in binary fields. And then we're going to very quickly move into an example to show how this theory is used for error detection. And so basically, binary field arithmetic is an area of math that uses polynomials to represent bit sequences. And basically, the exponent of each term in the polynomial gives the position of the bit 
and the coefficient of each term in the polynomial gives the value of the bit, either one or zero. And so let's do an example, a couple examples to illustrate how this works. So let's first of all consider a nibble, four bits, where the value of the most significant bit is i3, then i2, then i1, and then the least significant bit is i0. And so, you know, we could put this in a little, I don't know, four bit frame, if you like. And the way that binary field arithmetic would represent this bit sequence is as a polynomial i, which is a function of x. And the first term in the polynomial would be the most significant bit value, i3, multiplied by a term x, and the exponent of x would be 3. And that, as we're going to see, indicates bit position. And we'll do more examples and you'll get more comfortable with this as we move along. The next term in the polynomial has i2 as a coefficient. It's multiplied by x squared, then i1, multiplied by x to the 1, and then i0 multiplied by x to the 0. And so let's give a, maybe a more specific example where we've got a, a byte of 8 bits. So we have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And so in this case, our polynomial, whoops, would be 0 times x to the 7 plus 1 times x to the 6 plus 1 times x to the 5th plus 0 times x to the 4th and so on. I'll just finish this up. Uh, did I make a mistake? No. Zero, one, one, zero, one times x cubed plus zero times x squared plus one times x to the one plus one times x to the zero. Now, generally speaking, when we write out these polynomials, Anything multiplied by zero, of course, is zero. And so we don't show those terms. So really, when we write out this polynomial, it would be, and we don't, um, you know, when the coefficient is one, we, we usually don't explicitly write that. So this polynomial is then just equal to x to the sixth plus x to the fifth plus x cubed plus x. We don't um, write the x to the one because x to the one is just x. And then x to the 0 is, of course, 1. So then we just write this as 1. And so basically then, you know, we, we're, again, we're using these polynomials to represent strings or sequence of bits. And just as, as a little bit of a, of a definition, the degree of the polynomial is basically the value of the largest exponent in the polynomial. So for our example, our degree would be equal to six. And usually we use the, um, or often I will use the letter K to represent the degree. So as you're gonna find out the, you know, when we add, subtract, multiply, divide these polynomials, we're basically using regular algebra. We're just sort of multiplying 
x to a certain exponent by another x to a certain exponent. And all of it's going to look fairly familiar, except that in binary field arithmetic, we do all of our math modulo 2. And I'll just sort of give you a, a little table to kind of explain what I, I mean by that. And so that means that, you know, let's say we have a number and then what would the, the modulo two value of that number be? Well, if we have the number zero, zero mod two is, is zero. If we have one, then one mod two is, is one. If we have two, two mod two is zero. If we have three, um, three mod two is, is one and so on. If we have minus one, if we have a negative one, that's the same as having just a positive one. If we have a negative two, then that's the same as just having zero. So just taking the modulo of the positive value. And so basically there's no difference between uh, the negative and positive numbers and that ends up resulting in basically the addition and subtraction operations as being equivalent, which is going to be important later on when we get into the actual CRC calculation. And so what does this mean when doing kind of polynomial algebra? Well, it means a couple of things. So if we have, I guess maybe, so the implications of this, if we have x plus x, then with normal algebra, x plus x is equal to 2x. However, we do everything modulo 2, and we know that 2 modulo 2 is 0. So this actually is equivalent to 0 times x, or 0. So if you have a, a coefficient of 2, you just take the, the mod 2 of it, and you get 0, and that ends up zeroing out the term. If we have x plus x plus x, that's equal to 3x. 3 modulo 2 is 1, so this is equal to 1 times x, or in other words, x. So basically, the way it works is you just do regular old algebra, get some kind of integer number for your coefficient, and then take the mod 2 value of that coefficient when you're finished. Um, this means that, you know, x minus x is equal to 0 times x, which is still equal to 0. So that doesn't change because 0 mod 2 is 0. If we have negative x, that's equal to obviously negative 1 times x. Negatives and are just switched over to their equivalent positive value modulo 2. So this is then equal to 1 times x, which is just equal to x. And so the um, you know, negative values basically end up getting converted into positive values. And so it's important to kind of remember this because, you know, or, or keep this table, maybe just sort of write it down on a piece of paper and set it off to the side, because I'm going to start to work through a series of examples to show you what addition, subtraction, and multiplication looks like. And it's just going to be straight up regular old algebra, except that when we're finished, again, we take the modulo two of the coefficient. Okay, so what I want to do now is show you um, examples of binary field, polynomial addition, subtraction, and multiplication. I'm going to save division for kind of for the end because it's a little bit more involved. But let's start with addition. So in this example, let's add two polynomials. The first one will be x cubed plus x plus 1, and let's add that to x to the fourth plus x. So just start by doing just regular algebra. So we have x to the fourth, whoops, 
x to the fourth plus x cubed plus 2x plus x. Whoops, nope. Two x plus one. So that was, um, you know, just just regular algebra. However, once we're done, we have to take modulo two of our coefficients, and we know that two modulo two is zero. So this term actually goes to zero, and our final answer is x to the fourth plus x cubed plus one. So subtraction. Let's take those same two polynomials, but let's subtract this time. Oops, subtract. Okay, so we have negative x to the fourth plus x cubed plus one minus one times x, um, or x minus x basically, plus one. And so, you know, even in regular old algebra, this term would go to zero. And this first term is the same thing as minus one times x to the fourth, but we know that working with our modulo two terms, we have negative one is the same as positive one. And so the result is x to the fourth plus x cubed plus one. And what you'll notice then is that the result from addition is the same as the result from subtraction. And the two operations are equivalent in binary field math. And again, that's gonna be important. So just kind of file that fact away. It's gonna be important later on when we seek to understand how the CRC checksum scheme works. So finally, let's do multiplication. And let's this time take our two polynomials and multiply them together. So those are our terms all multiplied out. And then let's just group our terms. X to the seven. So that's just regular old algebra. Then we take modulo two of the coefficients. So this term goes to zero. And our final answer is X to the seventh. And so hopefully that kind of makes sense. Again, just very familiar algebra, just this modulo two thing with the coefficients when you're finished. One side note that I can make at this point that again is gonna become important a little bit later on is that our notion of having error patterns represented where we represent sort of a, a bit, an error position as a one and a, and a correct bit as a zero actually is fully supported by binary field math. And that's gonna help us sort of understand CRC error detection again a little, a little bit later on. So very specifically, we've already talked about having, you know, let's say a, a transmit frame bit pattern where maybe we have one, zero, one, one, zero as our um, 
as our transmitted bits in our frame, then we have an, an error pattern where, let's say we have errors in two bits. Then in our received frame, we basically take the exclusive or of the transmitted frame with the error pattern. And so the first and second most significant bits make it through okay. Um, the next two bits are flipped because of errors and then the last least significant bit makes it through okay. As it turns out, this sort of exclusive or error pattern works with polynomial addition as well. And so if we represent our transmitted frame using a polynomial, we have x to the fourth plus x squared plus x. And if we represent our error pattern, we have we can represent our error pattern as a polynomial x squared plus x. And so if we then add our error pattern to our transmitted frame, we get x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 2x. And taking modulo 2, this term goes to 0, this term goes to 0. And then our final answer is equal to x to the fourth, which represents our received frame because we only have a, a single one bit in the most significant bit position, and then all the other bits are 0. And so error patterns adding, you know, quote unquote, adding errors to a transmitted frame pattern works in binary field arithmetic. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about division. And division is really the main event because this is the operation that's fundamental to the CRC calculation. And when we divide polynomials, we're going to essentially do long division, just like we did, you know, sort of way back in, in grade school. And just as a little bit of a review, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of review the, the terms of long division. So we're going to take a polynomial G of X, use it to divide the polynomial P of X. And just as a, um, uh, as a bit of terminology, G is the divisor. And when we do our long division, we're going to get a polynomial Q of X, which we call, or which, which is referred to as the quotient. And we're gonna do a bunch of work, a bunch of work, and then at some point we're gonna get kind of a leftover polynomial, and that is the remainder. Right, and then the, again, these terms, I'm, I'm sure you, you've heard them before. This is just basically review. And so we can actually take the quotient, divisor, and remainder and use it to reconstruct our original polynomial. So our polynomial P of X is equal to the divisor multiplied by the quotient plus the remainder. And if you need to, you can do some examples just with whole numbers, you know, just to kind of, you know, refresh yourself or, or, or Google something like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually do an example with real polynomials. And we are going to take the divisor x cubed plus x squared plus one and use it to divide the polynomial x to the fifth plus x. Now, to set this up, we're going to have to leave gaps in to sort of, we're going to leave gaps where we have z coefficients of zero in the polynomial p of x that we're dividing. So we're going to start out by x to the fifth, and then I'm going to have a gap for the missing x to the fourth term, a gap 
for the missing x to the 3, x to the 2, we have x, and then finally another gap for the missing x to the 0 term. And you'll see why we need to make this space in a second. As it turns out, this is, um, you know, the, the using the polynomials, the polynomial notation is a little bit of a pain. I'm going to just do this example with the polynomials just to sort of show you how it works and to be consistent with our previous examples. And then I'm going to introduce sort of a one zero kind of shorthand that is much more efficient and will give you some insight into how this is actually implemented using digital hardware. So just like any long division, we have to take our divisor and kind of line it up with the maximum term in the um, in the the number that we're dividing, and so we want basically the highest order term in our divisor to line up with x to the fifth. And so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply our divisor by x squared to get its um, highest order term to line up with x to the fifth. And so if we multiply our divisor by x squared we get x to the fifth plus x to the fourth plus x squared, but we're going to leave a gap for where x to the cu x cubed would be, and then we're going to have x squared. And just to keep track of what we've done, over top of the least significant term in our divisor, we're going to record the fact that we multiplied our divisor by x squared. Okay, and once this is all lined up, just like regular long division, we're going to do a subtraction. So x to the fifth minus x to the fifth is zero. These terms, these gaps basically represent zero terms. And so zero minus x to the fourth is negative x to the fourth. But if we take the mod two of that, it's the same thing as positive x to the fourth. We have a zero term in here. And then we have negative x squared, but of course that's the same thing as positive x squared. And so now what we're going to do is again, we're going to multiply our divisor by whatever value of x we need to line up with our highest um, order term. In this case, it's x to the fourth. So we're going to multiply our divisor by x. And when we get that, we get x to the fourth plus x cubed, we have nothing here, and then we have x. We're going to keep track of the fact that we multiplied by x, so we're going to put that in the quotient, and then we're going to pull down our x term from the, the number that we're dividing, just so we have all of our terms lined up. Then we subtract x to the fourth minus x to the fourth is zero. Negative x cubed, which is the same thing as positive x cubed. x squared, and then we have a zero term. Then we repeat. We want our divisor to line up with the highest order term in what we have left over here. In this case, our divisor is already x cubed, which matches the highest order term in our leftover result of our subtraction. And so we don't need to multiply it by anything. We can just write it. Basically, we multiplied by our divisor by one. So we're going to record that up here. And then we do our um, subtraction x3 minus x cubed minus x cubed is zero, x squared minus x squared is zero. 0 minus 1 is negative 1, but mod 2, that's the same thing as positive 1. And that's our result. We basically stop as soon as the result, as soon as the highest order exponent in um, the result of our subtraction is less than the highest order exponent in our divisor. So here we had x to the fifth, that's bigger than cubed, x to the fourth is bigger than cubed, x um, Sorry, I'll, I'll circle it, I'm just pointing. So we had x to the fifth, which is bigger than x cubed, x to the fourth, x 
cubed, which was the same. But here we have x to the 0, so we have to stop. And this result is our remainder. And what we have up here is the quotient. OK, and that's the complete example. Now, if you're seeing this for the first time, you're thinking, wow, that's a lot. There's maybe some stuff in there I didn't understand. There's terms all over the place. There were zeros. There are things being pulled down. And the way to get the hang of this is simply practice. We're going to do example after example after example of this kind of long division. I'm going to introduce a 1, 0 notation next, which is a little bit easier to work with. That's the notation that we're going to continue to use. Um, I'll do another example in the context specifically of the CRC error calculation. We'll do an example where we experience an error in a frame where we catch the error. We'll do an example where we miss the error. And then in the assignments, if you're taking this course for credit, we're going to do several more examples. And so you'll just do this over and over and over again. And, you know, I find that, you know, when I've taught this class in the past, you know, at this point, the students uh, in my class are generally like, whoa, what's going on? But as we practice this over and over again, everybody gets the hang of it. And without exception, when I give a midterm exam on the first half of the course and I ask a, um, a CRC question, without exception, that's the question that has the highest average. So, so students, you know, feel encouraged because with practice, um, you'll definitely get the hang of this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to redo the exact example we did on the previous slide, except rather than using the polynomials, which gets a little bit cumbersome, I'm just going to represent the polynomials as their original bit strings. And we're going to use our modulo 2 math. We're going to replace that with just exclusive OR mathematics with no carry bit. So our divisor polynomial was x cubed plus x squared plus x. That, if we write it as a bit string, is just equal to 1, 1, 0, 1. The polynomial that we were dividing was um, x to the fifth plus x. And if we represent that as a bit string, we have x to the fifth, four, three, two, one, and zero. So what I want to do now is over on the right hand side of the page, redo the example with these bit strings. So we're going to take the string 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. And we're going to divide it by 1, 1, 0, 1. And so the way that we're going to start is we're going to take our divisor polynomial and we're going to shift it so that the first 1 in our divisor lines up with the first 1 in the number that we're dividing. So that gives us 1, 1, 0, 1. And we're going to do a subtraction here, but that's basically just going to be the exclusive OR of these bit strings without a carry bit. Remember, that's important. There's no carry bit for this type of math. So 0, 1 is 1. 0 exclusive OR with 0 is 0. 0 exclusive OR with 1 is 1 and one exclusive word with one is zero. I'm not going to bother writing that leading zero. We then put a little one in our quotient that is over top of the last position in our divisor. Next thing we do is we pull down a one. We then line up our divisor. We do our exclusive or math. One exclusive or with one is zero. One x or zero is one. Zero x or one is one. We don't write the leading zero, but these two ones cancel out. We put a one over top of the last position in our divisor. Then we pull down a zero so that we have the same length of 
Um, so we're dealing with a string that's the same length as our divisor. And you'll see that I've sort of done that all the way along. So here we were dividing four bits by four bits. The result was only three bits long, so we pulled down the one to give us four bits, so it lined up with our divisor. The result was only three bits long, so we pulled down a zero to make it four bits to line up with our divisor. And then if we do zero exclusive word with one, we get one. And then the other bits are um, zero XOR with zero is zero, one XOR with one is zero. And I won't show these leading zeros. And so basically we stop when we run out of bits over here that we can pull down and we have a result that is shorter than the length of our divisor. So our divisor here is four bits long. After this operation, we ended up with just a single bit. We had no more bits up here to pull down, and so we had to stop. We record a one up there because that's the, the final position of our um, divisor, the least significant bit in our divisor for our last operation. And then the result here we have is our remainder. And then the result up here we have is our quotient. If you wanted to, you could translate this back to polynomial terms. So the remainder of one would just be one in polynomial terms. The quotient, however, would be x squared plus x plus one which is what we had in our, um, our previous example. But most of the time we, we just leave this in terms of ones and zeros. And in fact, as we're gonna learn, the quotient actually isn't really important for the, CR, the operation of the CRC. It's really actually the remainder that is the, the main event. It's a, it's, as it turns out, the remainder is actually going to be equal to our CRC checksum. And so again, Hopefully you can sort of look at this example. I know my sort of my ones and zeros got a little bit messy here as I kind of marked things up, but hopefully you can look at this example, compare it with the polynomial example on the previous slide and get a just kind of an idea of how we're how this division is working. Um, and then what we're going to do now is I'm going to in the next slide introduce the full CRC calculation, but it's basically going to be yet another division example. I'm just going to sort of put it into the context of error detection. So we're going to get more practice with seeing how this works. Okay, so now we're ready to introduce the CRC calculation, and we're going to use what we've learned about binary field arithmetic to understand exactly how CRCs work. And so I'm just gonna lay it out sort of step by step and we're gonna go through the whole procedure. So step one is find what we call a generator polynomial. Now these generator polynomials can't be just any polynomial. They've been specifically chosen to have effective or strong error detection techniques. Um, how you find these strong polynomials is definitely beyond the scope of what we're talking about. That sort of gets into kind of the graduate level discussion of error detection codes and finite, finite field arithmetic. But for most of us, that don't do that kind of research, there is a table of you know good generator polynomials that we can just sort of choose from. And the example polynomial that I'm gonna use is comes from the USB standard, and it is equal to, so we represent it by the letter G for generator. It's equal to x to the fifth plus x squared plus one. And then we would say that its degree k is equal to five. Because five is the value of the highest order uh, exponent in the polynomial. 
Step two. Step two is just to identify the payload. What's the information sequence that we want to protect with our CRC error detection scheme? And for this example, let's say that our payload is one, two, three, four, five. So that's five zeros, one, zero, one. And this, if this is our, our information, we can also represent this as the polynomial i, which is equal to, in this case, x to the 8 plus x squared plus 1. The next step is for us to take our information sequence and pad some zeros onto the end of it. And the number of zeros we pad is going to be equal to the order of our generator polynomial. And you'll see why this is important as we sort of progress through the example. So in this case, k is equal to 5. So our result, our resulting bit string is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 0, 1, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros. This is equivalent, if we want to sort of do this in sort of polynomial math, Padding something with k zeros at the end of it is equivalent to multiplying it by x to the k. And so when we do that, x to the fifth times i of x is equal to x to the 13 plus x to the 7 plus x to the 5. And if you want, you can satisfy yourself that this polynomial represents this new bit sequence because this is the 13th position now. This is the seventh position, and this is the fifth position. Okay, in our fourth step, we're actually going to generate our CRC checksum using the division operation. So if we let P of X be equal to our padded information sequence, then what we're going to do is we're going to divide p of x by our generator polynomial g. And that is, so what we're going to, I'm, so I'm going to, I'm going to do that now. And this is just going to be another straight up example of binary field long division. And I'm going to use the one zero notation basically. So, just to give myself some extra room here. We are going to take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we are going to divide it by 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay, and so we're going to start by lining up the most significant one in our divisor with the most significant one in the polynomial that we're dividing by. So we have 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. 
and I'm going to put a little one in our quotient over top of the least the position of the least significant bit in our divisor. And then we're just going to do our subtraction. Again, it's just the exclusive or with no carries. And I'm not going to bother writing any leading zeros if we have any leading zeros. So the result is one, zero, one. Now, we have to now pull numbers down from P of X until we have a bit string that's the same length as our divisor. And so right now we're left with only three bits. We need six. So I'm going to pull down six bits one, or sorry, I'm going to pull down three bits, zero, one. And then I'm going to line up our divisor, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. And I'm going to put a one up in our quotient over top of the least, the position of the least significant bit in our divisor. And you'll see, be you know, for the first time, I've had to pull down multiple bits in order to get something that's six bits long. In our previous example, I only ever pulled down one term um, for each of our subtractions, but now I've had to pull down three. And so if we have to pull down multiple bits, then we just, and we have a gap in our quotient, then we just fill in the gap with the zeros. So we do our division and we get or sorry, we do our subtraction, which is just our exclusive ORs, and we get one, zero, zero, zero. We have um, now a, a bit string that's only four bits long. We need two more bits to be equal to um, length six, which is the length of our divisor. So I'm gonna pull down two more zeros to give us the six bits that we need. I'm gonna line up our divisor I'm going to subtract. I'm going to record the position of our divisor because we skipped ahead by two bit positions. We had to pull down two bits. I'm going to fill in the gap with a zero. Now we're going to do our exclusive or subtraction one, zero, one. Um, now we have three bits. So I'm going to pull down three more bits. zero, 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 um, line up our divisor, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, and do our exclusive or subtraction. I'm gonna record the, pos the final position of the divisor. Um, the result is one, one, zero, one. Now we have, we're left with four bits that's shorter than the six bits of our divisor, and we have no more um, bits to pull down, so we have to stop here. As soon as we're faced with uh, a bit string resulting from our, subtract our subtraction that's shorter than the divisor, and we have no more bits to pull down, we have to stop. And so then one, one, zero, one ends up being our remainder. And you know, we have our quotient. Up here. So now, but as I as I suggested earlier, we actually don't care about the quotient, it's really the remainder that we're after. And I'll explain why that is now. And it really is this is going to kind of reveal the whole secret behind CRC error detection and why we had to learn this division stuff in the first place. And so this is basically the secret of CRC error detection. So the, what we do is we take an information sequence, we divide it by the generator polynomial, and we subtract off the remainder. That means that the resulting bit string that we get is evenly divisible by our generator because we've subtracted off the remainder. We send the information packet through the channel and then at the receiver, we divide whatever we get at the receiver by a copy of our generator. If it divides evenly, then we assume that the packet has been received correctly. If it does not divide evenly, then we assume that some of the bits have been corrupted during transmission and the packet should be discarded. 
So if we continue with our example now, what we want to do is we want to subtract off the remainder from our zero padded information uh, payload. So if you recall, our information payload was one, one zero one and then we padded I'm just gonna do a little dotted line here and then we padded it with five zeros and I'm gonna subtract off the remainder one one zero one and then the result is gonna be our information payload one zero one zero one one zero one because subtraction is the same as addition so one of the and and this hopefully you can see now why we padded the end of our information frame with zeros so if we hadn't padded our information with zeros when we subtracted off our remainder we actually would have corrupted our payload so we would have scrambled the last few bits by by subtracting off of the by subtracting off the remainder. And so the um, padding it with zeros means that we had basically some, some dummy information at the end of the frame that we that created room for us to, to perform our subtraction. And because the you know subtraction is the same as addition, you can basically see that essentially what we've done is we've append we've appended the remainder onto the end of the information payload. Is five zeros always gonna be enough? It always is, because remember when we do our long division, we don't stop the long division until we get um, a bit string that is shorter than our generator polynomial. Our generator polynomial has six bits, so that means our remainder can never be longer than five bits. And so padding the back of our information frame with five bits or five zeros is sufficient. And so this bit string is the final frame that we are going to send through our channel. This is our packet, if you like. So we've got um, eight bits Sorry, I guess um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine bits of information and then five bits of CRC checksum. When this packet is received, we're going to have a copy of the generator polynomial at the receiver. We're going to divide the whole received frame, the payload, and the generator, or sorry, the, the remainder at the end of it. And because this is equivalent to subtracting off the remainder, the result has to, should be equal to zero if no errors has occurred in our frame. So just to be explicit about this, step six, I think we're at step six. Yep. Step six. Transmit the packet y of x because now we can see that y of x represents our, our transmitted packet and then step seven divide the received packet by our generator polynomial g of x if the remainder for this division is non-zero, an error has occurred. And so let's do that last example. So I, I told you we'd be doing a lot of long division examples. So here's yet another one. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot. I'm just gonna go ahead and do this because hopefully by now you're going to, you, you kind of see how it works. But we, we take our receive packet and this time rather than the five zeros we have our remainder 
we have our, our checksum appended to it, which is equivalent is the result of subtracting off the remainder. We divide by a copy of our generator polynomial. And I'm just going to go ahead and do this. And happily, the last six bits in our subtraction exactly matches our generator polynomial. The result is zero. And we assume that the frame is OK. OK, so that's the, the complete example. And hopefully now you can kind of see how division is fundamental to understanding how CRC calculations work. And also, you know, how we sort of work in subtracting off the remainder and why we pad the zeros on the end of the information frame. Um, I'm going to finish this module by doing uh, two more examples just to like really kind of thoroughly go through this. One where I'm going to add an error pattern to the frame that we are going to detect and another one where I'm going to add an error pattern to the frame where or that we don't detect. Okay, so our two error examples are gonna build on our previous example. So we're gonna use exactly the same transmitted frame that we generated in the previous example. So zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, and our error pattern is going to be one, two, three, four, one, one, zero, 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 zero. So it's going to be a two bit error. If you recall, two bit errors are something that our, our old parity bit scheme would have trouble with. So let's see how the the CRC um, scheme deals with it. So our received frame, one, one, two, three. So we, those two zeros are flipped to ones, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. Okay, whoops, sorry, I won't flip away too fast. So this is our received frame. So we've got two bad bits now in the middle of the frame that we can see. So let's see um, if our division CRC check um, can spot these. So this is the received frame. So in the receiver, we're going to take whatever frame we have and divide it by a copy, copy of our generator polynomial. down three bits. So we only need to pull down a 
zero. Three bits. One, one, zero. And then pull down the last bit. And just as by way of a bit of notation, so we pull down the last bit, it's still not long enough to do a full division, but we still pull it down. We just put a zero there to indicate that we didn't do a division because it is part of the remainder. So even if we, even if pulling down a bit doesn't allow us to do one more subtraction of the divisor, we still pull it down. So the remainder is one zero one 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 and because it is non-zero we know that the frame is bad so our error detection scheme has worked okay so now as a final example let's consider an error pattern that is missed by the crc error detection scheme because even though it's a lot better um, and really the industry standard for error detection it isn't perfect there are some things that can potentially be missed and so again let's consider the same frame pattern that looks like this one zero zero one zero one now as a hint I'm, I'm going to explain why this error pattern is missed by the CRC but as a hint just take a look at this error pattern because Something about it should seem familiar if you look closely and then think back to the previous slides. So the receive frame, after we add this error pattern to it, is one zero one zero one 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 one. Yeah, that's right. Zero one one zero one. And so this is the frame that we receive and in order to see if an error has occurred we're going to take it just like we did in the previous example and divide it by the generator polynomial I've copied that out correctly and so now I'll just do the the division pull down a couple of ones
got everything right here. Zero, zero. And then pull down the last three bits. 101, and probably already you can see that we're in trouble. This term exactly matches our generator polynomial, and so we would say that there's no error. But wait, we know that there is an error. So what happened? Well, this particular error pattern was missed by our generator polynomial, and you'll remember that the whole nature of CRC error detection is to dependent on this notion of the frame being evenly divisible by the generator polynomial. And if you look back, you'll see that our error pattern actually was a shifted version of the generator polynomial. And of course, the generator polynomial is divisible by itself. And so if we add a copy of the generator polynomial to our received frame, as in the form of an error pattern, we're going to miss it. And so basically any error pattern that's evenly divisible by the generator polynomial will be missed by the CRC error detection. So this is the flaw of the scheme. As it turns out, it's not a huge flaw. In the next module, I will be discussing how to evaluate the performance of error detection schemes. And we'll see that even with this weakness, CRC error detection uh, provides quite excellent performance. And just to close off, I, I recognize this is a, a long module and um, I considered chopping it up, but I thought it was better to just have all this information in, in one place. Um, one last comment I wanna make is this sort of long division polynomial math is difficult for humans, particularly when you're seeing it the first time but it's super, super easy to implement in digital logic. So if you take a look at this picture of the long division when we use the one zero notation, you can basically see that we're taking our generator polynomial, and I'll just change the color of my pen here to make this more clear. We're taking the generator polynomial and we're essentially sliding the same polynomial along the length of our received frame. So you can imagine this polynomial being slid along the frame and then it being exclusive ordered with the frame in intervals. And so basically the way that CRC error detection is implemented is literally by a shift register or a, a digital structure that includes a shift register and some exclusive or kind of taps attached to different parts of the shift register at locations that are determined by the generator polynomial. I'm, I'm not going to get into these, um, get into this in a huge amount of detail. I just wanted to point that out just so you can kind of recognize this, this notion of kind of a sl the generator polynomial sliding along and appreciate that this does lend itself to an efficient shift register style digital uh, structure.